question. Who, had a who set a resolution on New Year's Day? Raise your hand. If you had a resolution, you don't have to say it. You don't have to say it. And today is January 12th. Uh, researchers have found that those who made a re uh, resolution on New Year's Day, 75% of them have already given up on it. By today. 12 days. I don't mean to be disheartening, but they found that 75% have given up on their resolution. And they say, for one reason, is that they have, you might say, they, have, they um, had too high of expectations. Un, it's called, un, uh, what's the term? Unattainable. Unattainable expectations. Unrealistic expectations. And so by the 12th day, they have given up even trying because they have unrealistic expectations. I want you to remember that for just a moment, but I just want to do a quick review from last week, and Cheryl kind of touched on it. In the story of Michelangelo in the forming of taking his block of marble, and while many other artists and many other professional sculptors had given up on this huge slab of marble, that Michelangelo said, I, I see something beyond the marble. I see something inside the marble. And he said, when asked again, let me just repeat that quote for you. He said, in regards to someone who asked him, how did you do such a beautiful job with the statue of David? What did you do that this beautiful, this ugly piece of marble is not this beautiful statue? And he said, in every block of marble, I see a statue as plain as though it stood right before me, shaped perfectly in attitude and action. I have only to cue it up. I only to take the rough walls away that's imprisoning this lovely image that I have in my mind. He goes on to say, he just cuts away everything that doesn't look like the image. All of us are works in progress. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Now, let's apply that to a spiritual life. All of us are works in progress. We're not finished, as an earlier course talked about. <clears throat> we still have much work to do. And I know I left you kind of hanging last week when talking about transfiguring, the transfiguration and the transformation. Remember the word, the English word that we use for those two words? The word metamorphosis. It means that a metamorphosis, like a butterfly from a, from a cocoon to a butterfly, or from a tadpole to a frog, this transformation or transfiguration that God is speaking about in Romans chapter 12 to be transformed in your thinking, in your mind, to have a new attitude, a spiritual attitude. It's a gradual change on the inside. That produces a total transformation on the outside. So to truly grow in Christ, something has to begin to be transformed inside. I mean, I can always put on nice suits and ties. I can put on good shoes and nice, you know, really look spiffy like you might see on TV. Have gold watches. <laughs> but that means nothing. Because it's the transformation takes place on the inside. I've seen some people dressed very poorly that have a rich spirit. I've seen people dressed, maybe even look like they were bombs, but yet they said God is still good. They would talk about how God has been with them and, and answered prayers for them. And so I want you to understand that transformation needs to take place if we're going to grow in Christ. And uh, the title again says, Lord, please change me. We need to understand that the change begins from the inside and works its way out. And that's how we are transformed into the image of Christ. You'll find that in Romans 8, 29. Paul saying, hey, God has already predestined that we should be made in the image of Christ. You know, you, well, no matter where you're at in your spirit, God's plan for you is that you would be the image of Christ, be the image of his son. So when people see you, they will see Christ as 
as earlier mentioned, that we are hands and feet. That they would see the hands of Christ. That they would see the face of Christ in us. That's where transformation truly begins to take place. That's where the change truly begins as we allow God to change us. So how does God do this? How does God change us? It comes, it kind of leads us into we must reprogram our minds. Now, what is our biggest struggle? Who's our biggest enemy? Who would be our biggest enemy to deal with every day? Ourselves. Ourselves. We are our biggest enemy in regards to transforming into the image of Christ. But I want to do a little historical correction here. Because, you know, we've heard the story, the quote, we, must, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. But the original quote comes from Lake Erie, the Battle of Lake Erie, Army General William Henry Harrison. After he, after he, when he won the war, he won the battle, this is what he said. He said, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Wouldn't it be great as, a, as believers if we could say, we have met the enemy and we've defeated him. The enemy's ours. We've taken possession of it. They no longer have power over us. And so I began to embrace that quote. We have met the enemy and the enemy is ours. I'm not going to allow. So we have to rethink the way we think. I'm not going to allow the, uh, the enemy to discourage me. So we must renew our minds. And that re requires, you might call it reprogramming. I'm using modern te terminologies. It requires kind of like a rebooting of the way we think. A Charles Ryan in 1972 came out, and he said he came, he came out, and he came out with a formula about how this transformation could take place. And it was T plus H H <coughs> equals S T. The T is for time. The H H is for habits of holiness. We call them spiritual disciplines. And then the S G equals spiritual growth. To understand that spiritual growth is a process of time. Because we have our own, the enemies that we deal with every day, our habits and behaviors, have a tendency to come back and haunt us. And so we have to fight that battle again. And it takes determination to develop those spiritual habits, those holy habits. I want to share with you John Wesley's spiritual, some of those spiritual habits are, or holy habits are, prayer. Prayer is a holy habit. Bible study is a holy habit. And I know this has probably been my, my biggest struggle, journaling is a holy habit. Fasting is a holy habit. Taking communion, sharing communion, is a holy habit. And lastly, witnessing to what God has done is a holy habit. Let me tell you some of his habits in regards to prayer. Wesley, Wesley would spend time at the beginning of every day in prayer for two hours. He also liked to say a short prayer every hour on the hour throughout the day. And we begin every important action with a prayer. In Bible study, he would use his travel time on horseback to read his Bible. He loved scripture so much, he said, I want to be a man of one book. And he knew the Bible very well. He would win Bible quizzes, Bible trivia today. Now this is where he puts me to shame in journaling. He used a daily journal to record 
his experiences, and his conversations. And often kept a separate daily diary to list how he spent each hour of his time and the different temptations he faced. These will all be in his journal. And he had volumes of journals. He then would regularly review both his daily journal to see where he still needed to grow spiritually. So not only wrote in it, but we would re review it to see where he needed to grow. And in fasting, Wesley had a weekly rhythm of Fasting breakfast and lunch every Wednesday and Friday. He would also occasionally go on longer fast and pray for something specific. I want to ask the question, did that just happen? Did he just all of a sudden wake up and said, I'm going to start praying for two hours in the morning? Did he just say, okay, I'm going to start studying my Bible like it's no other book. I'm going to start writing in my journal every hour on the hour of what God is doing in my life. Do you think there was something that he just decided to pick up and start doing in one day or a week? It was a process of time that these disciplines began to take hold of his life. So I want you guys to begin to talk about this renewing of the mind, this rebooting of our thinking and that God is willing to work with us in renewing our minds, transforming them from the inside out. To not be discouraged in the 12 days like we have been in our resolutions. To know that it will take time. It's like the man said yesterday in the radio. If your resolution was to pay off a $40,000 loan in one year, then you have, you have high expectations and unrealistic expectations if you think you're going to do that in one year. It will take 10 years depending on what you plan in your budget to do. And so it directs our spirit as well. Sometimes we set unrealistic expectations for ourselves and you start saying, well, I'm going to set a resolution, I'm going to make a resolution and a commitment to God to pray for two hours every morning. And within four or five days, it's like, I don't know, I think I'll stand better a little longer. And then you start looking at your watch and say, eh, it's been 30 minutes, that's good enough. And then before you know it, you say, next up uh, on the fifth day, you say, oh, 20 minutes should be good. And then you start thinking, you know, I failed at this, so I'm just going to give up. But I want to encourage you that when you start out on a spiritual journey, God is there to carry you too. It's like that, the many times I showed the video of Redmond. The story of Redmond when he, he pulled his hamstring while running in the 440 Olympics and his dad runs out there on the track and brings him to the finish line. When he reached a point that he couldn't do it himself, the father comes out on the track and begins to take him toward the finish line. That's where God is. He sees, he knows where we have weaknesses. He knows there are areas that we have struggles in. He knows we may not be up to two hours a day. He may say, okay, start with 20 and work your way up. Or how about journaling? Maybe just journal once a week. Start with once a week. And try to add a little bit each time. And I know many people like to read through the Bible every year. And even now they have yearly Bible readings that it makes it much simpler to cover the Bible throughout the entire year. Fasting is where I believe that the devil really attacks us when we try to fast. Because so many times that's where we fall short. We have a goal to maybe pass the meal. And all of a sudden, we forget. Oh, we have, before we understand it, we have a, a sandwich in our mouth. Oh, I meant to pass. Okay, I'll just finish the sandwich. <laughs> but I want you to know, and the next equation that, that's there, it's capital T plus capital H H plus capital G-E equals S-G. Now what can that S-G mean? We just talked about G-E stands for godly encouragement equals spiritual growth. In Hebrews chapter, eight, chapter 10, verse 25, Paul writes that do not forsake the assembly of others. Now people say churches 
and we try to do our best as pastors inside by trying to make it something that you can take home and remember, something applicable for you, how you can grow in your spirit, something that you can apply to your life, that you can leave here saying, I, maybe I can apply this this week to what I've heard this week. And we also find encouragement. How many times have you come needing somebody to say, you know, I can tell you're not having a good day, but you've had a bad week. I've heard your story, and you need encouragement. You see so many people say, well, I don't need church. I have to live my Christian life without church. What you're missing out is the spiritual encouragement that comes from church. The people, now hear this, people in church, we are not here to discourage people. <laughs> Although some in churches have taken that on as some sort of discipline. But we are here to encourage people in their growth. Yes, they may not be where you are at in your spirit. You hear me on that? We may not be where they're at, or we may be ahead of someone else in our spiritual understanding. That doesn't mean we gloat over that and say, well, I wouldn't be doing that. I wouldn't be saying that. We are to be people who are encouraging one another, lifting each other up in the church. <clears throat> But that's where we also find our spiritual growth. You share your prayer concerns with us. And we pray that those are encouraging to you to know that there are people praying for you. So do not forsake the assembly of ourselves as a manner that some have, but exhorting one another. I mean, I encourage you to read this. But exhorting one another, and so much more as you see his day coming. Godly encouragement comes from within the church. We've lost that sense of encouraging one another for some reason. We've become, for some reason, I think our, we've allowed society's critical, you know, our critical, serious nature from society has sunk into the church and we see things through a critical eye instead of through God's eyes. And so that's how, that's one way in which we can remind ourselves that through time, through holy habits, through uh, spiritual growth, that don't forsake the church because that's where we find spiritual encouragement. Godly encouragement. So, Romans 12, verse 2 says, Teach us spiritual metamorphosis. That God intends that we will slowly but surely be transformed from the inside out. That we will slowly be transformed by the chipping away of the old self. Remembering that God has an image of Christ in you already that you don't even see. Imagine that. God has an image of Christ that you don't even see yourself. And he's saying, if you'll work with me, we're going to work together and we're going to get that image of Christ. If you allow me to chip those things away in your life, we're going to begin to see that image begin to become more and more vivid. And others will begin to see that image more and more Vivid. So it will not happen by accident. Let me let me share that. <clears throat> Walking out the door, all of a sudden, God will not just all of a sudden, boom! I feel like praying for two hours. I feel like reading my Bible. Remember, it's not going to happen as you walk out of the church. It's going to. It's not happening by accident. Let me just share that. It does not happen overnight. It cannot happen without the Holy Spirit <clears throat> with His help. It happens when you make a personal commitment to it. <clears throat> now, isn't it interesting? We can make personal commitments to various things in this world, but when it comes to God, we're very relaxed in making serious commitments to Him. It happens when, as we become more what God made us to be. It happens as we behold the glory of Christ through worship and through our times of devotion. This is how the mind is renewed. This is how the mind is renewed. It won't happen. I wish somebody would have preached this when I was younger. I would beat myself up so much because of many times I failed. In all these disciplines, fasting and, and studying, and the devil would say, man, you're a terrible Christian. Oh no, that's how he gets us. You know, 
I wish someone would have told me, well, you know, it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall sometimes. But he's there to help you get back up and get you on your way again through his grace. It's not going to happen overnight, yet. You're not going to become a super Christian as some people think they are. It's going to take time for the image of Christ to come out in you. So just allow me to chip those things away. Be obedient to what I'm sharing with you, he said. He would, he would share with me. <coughs> Isn't it great that you could begin today knowing what the, how the devil's going to discourage you. You can leave today knowing that he's going to say, hey, you're a failure. You're a failure. And you can go out and say, no, I'm not. It's just going to take a little more time. <laughs> This is going to take a little more time. So as you begin to embark on your great adventure and allowing God to transform your thinking, I want you to go in thinking it's not going to be easy. I don't want you to think it's going to be easy. I want you to know it will be a battle. It will be a struggle. And what's the old saying? Nothing worth if it doesn't take something effort it's not worth making the effort for. You know? I mean, I think about the effort you had to go through to get to college, to study hours after hours after hours, staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning and taking a test at 7, going on a little sleep. But it was worth it when it was all over. And that the phone was handed to. So the same thing is for all of us. When you begin to make that effort to grow in your spirit, there's going to come a time when you stand before God and you say, man, the effort that we worked together on was worth it. It was worth it. <coughs> I'm glad I put that extra time in prayer. I'm glad I put that extra time in studying the Bible. I'm glad I put that extra time in witnessing. I'm glad I put that time in going to church and, and getting to know people and being encouraged by that. I'm glad I put that time in. Because in the end, you're going to say, man, that was worth it. That was worth it. I often think to myself, man, it took me too long to accept the I felt like many times the years I wasted not obeying God's call. I'll never know. I'll never know this law. I call them the lost years. Because the times that I was being called and I wouldn't obey. And I think, I wonder what would have happened if I had given them two or three years sooner. What would have happened? I'll never know. But I always in the back of my mind wonder if I would have been obedient just a little sooner, how much more may I have been able to accomplish? But I'll never know. Because I wasn't obedient, I just, I wasn't, I was in, I was serving the Lord, but I wasn't really uh, hearing him call. I mean, I was, I didn't want to hear his call. Isn't that funny how that happens sometimes? When God's asking us to change, and I don't want to change. Well, that's just me, I know, but. <laughs> but I want you, you're embarking on a great adventure, and I want you to know that. There's a Ruth Graham is buried, and she engraved something very interesting on her gravestone. In her on her stone, she says, "This is the end of construction. Thank you for your patience." On her gravestone, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. Do you hear the faint sound of God chipping away at you? Do you feel a sense of God's spirit? Maybe just bringing something to mind that maybe chipped or may need to be chipped off. Sand it off. You want to use a carpenter's term to sand it down. Or hammer it out. Or saw it. God and I have met the enemy and the enemy gods. Wouldn't that be 
the great being able to say that all those enemies that are within me, all those things that have trouble with me in my spirit, that are flying out together, will be able to say, we have met the enemy, and now the enemy's ours. It's defeated. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are embarked upon a journey, an adventure, a godly adventure that we, we may not know exactly where we're going, like Abraham. We're just called to go. And your open ways, your, your way is directions we never planned on going, but yet we'll never be disappointed in the journey. So now, Lord, I pray that your spirit <coughs> may remind us, may speak to us about certain areas that we need to chip away so that you can begin to work a metamorphosis within us and change our thinking, change our hearts from the inside out so that the image of Christ may be revealed. Hear our prayers. Hear our silent prayers. Hear the prayers of our heart this morning. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I chose a chorus entitled, Do It Again. And it reminds us that we will. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, you might fail. Let's go ahead and then get that out of the way. You might fail as you begin to seek God's metamorphosis. But get up and do it again, and God will be with you.